Lord Jesus, we just come to you this morning as your people. And Lord, I just ask that you might open up the hearts of your people to hear your voice this morning. Lord, we don't want to leave here and, and just not hear your voice. We don't want to leave here and not feel your presence. We don't want to leave here, Lord, and, and not know what to do next. All these things, Lord, as we come together, Lord, you choose to speak to us. And so, Lord, I just commit this word to you. May your people hear the voice of their shepherd and what they need to hear, Lord, I pray would go through to their hearts. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for, the, for your Son, and that, Lord, you gave him to us, and he has become so precious and so dear to every one of us. And I thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit, which, Lord, would, makes it all possible that we can hear him, that we can move forward. So I ask, Lord, that you would bring it all together now in Jesus' mighty name. I feel like a visiting preacher this morning because we were down at Kingston for two nights. <laughs> Had to get up a bit earlier and I you know, hope I come with the same anointing. <laughs> Is everybody breathing here this morning? Good. <laughs> There's a word for you here somewhere. Those of you that might be visiting, I've been preaching about the judgment seat of Christ. Not for any reason other than to find out the things we need to do to be able to please Jesus Christ because when we come before the throne he will, he will seek each one of us individually and ask us what we did with our salvation. And so this whole series has been all about just trying to do the right things by our Lord and Saviour. And this morning I want to talk about how we run that particular race which God has chosen for us. Now, I didn't know the Olympics were going to start. <laughs> this just happens to be the next one in the series that I'm preaching on. So we're going to be looking at that subject today. 1 Corinthians 9.24 Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the price, sorry, the prize, run in such a way that you may obtain it. Paul seemed to love to look at his life as if he was in some race and quite often and most of these scriptures actually come from Paul and it is an interesting way to look at our Christian walk that we are in some race we don't think we're in a race until we actually get down the so sort of down the road a bit but as we start to you know look at our Christian walk from that perspective it's interesting how it all comes together now Paul says, run in such a way that you might obtain it, but only one receives the prize. Now, is Paul saying here that only one of us are going to get the prize and we should all just run like crazy just in case we miss out on the prize? Well, if you look at the context of this and where he's saying it, he's not saying that, but what he's trying to get is this message across to us about how we run the race. It's our attitude that we should have in the way that we are walking for Jesus. And it's no different than the attitude of a runner who puts his name down to run a race. He has an attitude to go for it with all his heart. And this is what Paul is saying here. We need to have this attitude in our lives and where we are focused on Jesus Christ. And our attitude should be not just something that is, is some goal that we're trying to achieve, but it's something which draws us to him. And the great focus for all of us is the one thing which brings us all together, and that's his love. We all know his love. We're all drawn to his love. And even though Paul goes on to talk about the different crowns and all these things, I can assure you that's the last thing on my, on my mind when I'm thinking about walking and doing the things of God. The thing which motivates me, the thing which drew me, the thing which keeps me going is his great love for me. And I assume it's the same for all of you. It's that love he has for us. This is the goal which is before us. This is the thing that he keeps on dropping in front of us all the time the golden carrot, if you want to look at it that way, but it's, it's real. It's, it's not a prize. It's something personal and something very real. That love called us to him. Somehow in all that noise and all that darkness, 
His love reached through one day and touched our hearts. And we turned around and we started to walk to him. And we found him. It's that love which constantly spurs us on. It's that love which was able to get our hearts to be able to surrender to him. Nothing else caused us uh, yet to surrender to him. It wasn't the fact that we're going to die and all the legalism behind him. It was the fact that he loved us so much. And with that, we were able to surrender our love to him and go on. It's his love which becomes a beacon for each and every one of us. We all go through darkness. We all have our battles. And yet his love shines in the middle of that darkness every time and gives us somewhere to go to. He has never left us without that beacon. It's his love that fills us. It's his love that strengthens us. It's his, it's his, his love which motivates us every time. It, it's a love which transforms us. We're not who we are when we first started with him. We are being changed constantly. Each day something happens in us because of his love. Bits of us are falling off. Bits that don't... That, you know, you know, you know, which shouldn't be in us are falling off because his love is transforming us through the sanctification process of our walk with him. But it's his love which is doing that and we keep going forward. It's his love which is unstoppable. You try and stop the love of God towards you, you can't. Because he says nothing can separate you from his love. Believe me, people try, you try sometimes to separate yourself from the love of God, but you can't. It's always there. And it's this passion that we should all have, and that should be our goal in the way we look to the things of, of what we are doing for him. And if we have that passion, then that love transforms us, not just in our mind, but in our body and in our soul and in our spirit. The Bible talks about being transformed into his likeness. And that's what his love is all about. It keeps us on this race, on this road. You know, many people lose that first love. And if you look at Strong's, it says there that the first love means, the first means first in time or place or first in rank. In other words, when Jesus said that in Revelation uh, yeah, to, to a church, he was saying, you've lost that first love. In other words, I was once first in your life. I was your everything. I was the thing that you woke up for in the morning. And somewhere you've, 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 you've put me second or even last, or you've even turned away from me. And Jesus keeps telling us to come back to the first love. Because if we haven't got that first love, we lose the passion and we lose that direction and we lose the heart and we lose the strength and everything else in our being to keep us moving towards what Jesus wants us. Now, why am I saying all this? Because we need like a runner to have that in our heart and our mind. Otherwise, why get up in the morning? If we're not going to run the race for Christ if we're not going to allow his love to draw us into the day and what each day faces, and each day can be any number of things, good and bad, but if his love draws us, then that becomes the motivation to move towards him and to keep on going. And we need to have that as our motivation. That is the passion and that is the prize in which we all should have and it is easy to lose but Jesus tells us come back to his first love come back to that thing which captivated you to him and let that be reignited second point don't look back Philippians 3 12 to 14 says not that I have already attained or am already perfected but I press on that I may may lay hold of that which Christ has already laid hold of for me. Brethren, I do not count myself as having apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, 
and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press forward to the goal, the prize, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul knew that he hadn't got there. And if anybody had got there, I think Paul was, was the one I would look to and say, well, yeah, he's, he's up there with the winners. And yet Paul knew that all the way through his life he hadn't got there. He was still pressing forward with every breath that he took. He said, Jesus has got something for me. He's already got it for me. And I'm just pressing forward to that time when I can grab hold of it for myself. But he gives us a warning there. He says, forget what is behind. Paul had a, had a lot of things to forget behind him. He was a murderer of, of you know, Christians. He had all this thing behind him, all this garbage behind him, and yet he had before him this goal, this love of Christ, and to do the right thing by, by Christ. And we are told to not look back, but to look forward in the things of God. Jesus himself said, no one having put his hand to the plough and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now why did Jesus say that? Well, it's pretty easy because if you look a bit further in, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, 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 can't even remember my own writing. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, it's Colossians 2, 13 and 14. And you who are dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by the cancelling of the record of the debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Now people, if Jesus had personally nailed everything in your past to the cross, it seems to me that we shouldn't be looking back to what the things which he has dealt with. And we need to move forward in the things of God. And everything I find in my life is that Jesus is always pointing me forward. The only person I know who points, who points me back is the devil. Because if he can point me back, all of a sudden I'm turning back, I'm looking back, and I get my eyes off Christ, and I get my eyes onto situations, and down I go. Jesus has done it all at the cross. He has finished the work. We need to press forward knowing that. Otherwise, we will constantly look over our shoulders we will constantly listen to the devil who will say, you've done this and you haven't done this, and look at you, look at your past, look at all this, why haven't you done this? When Jesus says the opposite, he said, I finished it at the cross and it has been finished. And we need to understand that we need to look forward in the things of God and press on to the things which he has for us. We haven't all got there, have we? Has anybody got there? I haven't. Thank you. I've got a long way to go. There are things in me that God is still dealing with, and I've been 35 years a Christian, and I'm still bringing things before the Lord. But I don't stop there, because I know that there is a way through, and Jesus makes a way through. As long as I've put my eyes on him, on the cross and his blood and the finished work, he will find a way through for me. And it doesn't matter where we're at. Jesus constantly says, come to him. Why? Because, because we're not ready there yet. He wants to work with us and get these things done. Now, it doesn't matter if you're coming fifth, sixth, 36th, or even last. We should always look forward. There was a guy in the 2002 Winter Olympics, speed skating, lovely sport to watch, fast as anything. His name was yeah, Stephen Brambury. He was an Australian guy, and he was one of the five finalists in this race. And yet he was a ranked outsider. They said there was no way he could win. And when you watch that race, he was coming last all the way, vroom, 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 around this ring. He was just in there, but he was right behind these front four. And he was going to lose. It was pretty obvious he was going to lose. Come to the last lap, the last corner of the last lap, one man goes down and he takes out first, second, third and fourth. And Stephen just cruised across. <laughs> People, 
never give up. You don't know what's around the next corner. You don't know if you're going to come first, last, or, or halfway down. It doesn't matter. You press on as if you're going to win. Next point, patience. Who's got patience here? <laughs> no, all right, yeah, we're all in the same boat. Hebrews 12, 1. Let us lay aside every weight and every sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run the race with patience, the race which is set before us. Now, unless you've got a very short life, I can assure you that the, the Christian race is a very long one. We are not in the 100 metre dash. Our race is more like the marathon. It starts from the time that we are saved until the time we take our last breath. That's why I asked you, is anyone not breathing here this morning? So you're still in the running, and this applies to you. We all suffer from impatience. When things get hard, we tend to go, oh. we tend to drop back, we tend to give up. And we all suffer from this lack of patience. And Jesus warns us about that. But we have to run the race with endurance. In other words, we have to realise it's not going to happen now. It mightn't even happen tomorrow. But it will happen down the track. And that's the way we look at things when it comes to the things of Jesus Christ. If we say it hasn't happened, Lord, and it hadn't happened yesterday, it doesn't matter. It will still happen in, the, in God's time and we need to look with his eyes and realise that it will happen. Now, people, if you lose that patience and lose that endurance, you start to say things like it's too hard and you start to grumble and you start to give up. But I want you just to stop and think for a second how many people do you know who have given up? Now, I can look in this congregation and see empty seats that I remember faces that used to sit here and aren't sitting here now because somehow it became too hard. Now, I've been to other churches as well and I can remember people in those churches and other churches. I've known friends that have dropped out because it has become too difficult Somehow the road becomes too narrow. We walk in a narrow road and people don't like that and they give up and they drop out. For whatever reason, it be, they lose that strength but they lose, that, they lose sight of the promise that they had and with that, they stop going somewhere. People, as we go in the, into the race of God, sooner or later we do get to the stony ground. We, we do get to the thorns and the thistles. But you've got to press through that into the fertile ground in which God has for you. Otherwise, those things will bring you down and you'll find yourself dropping out. Now, the road to heaven is littered by people who have given up because they've found it too hard. They've lost their first love. For whatever reason, it doesn't matter. They are there on the sides and they are not here. They are not in the kingdom, but they're on the side. Now, we all know them. We don't have to you know, think too hard about it. And our heart goes out for them because there, but for the grace of God, go you or I. It's only God's grace that keeps us on the track. It's only God's grace and love which keeps us going. But somehow those people have lost that and they've dropped off. And I can tell you many times I've come to that crossroad where I've wanted to give up because it just got too hard, it got too painful and it hurt too much. And I remember the first time it happened, the one, the most vivid one, I was crying out to God for an answer because it was just that hard and I didn't know what to do. Do you know the only answer I got from God was a scripture where he said, do you also want to go away? Now you probably know where that comes from, but that's the only word I got from God. I was looking for some answer, it's going to be all right, Terry, you know, just keep going another day and I'll fix it for you. And that's the only answer I got. 
But I tell you, in that time and in that place, I knew that God would always leave the choice with me as to whether I came or whether I went or whether I gave up or whether I, I actually pressed on. And I decided in that day to hang on. And I hung on by a thread. And I thought that thread was going to break. But by the grace of God, God took me through it. And by the grace of God, I came out the other side. And many of you will, will have gone through similar situations where the pain gets too much, the frustration gets too much. Just getting up out of bed is just too much. And all we want to do is give up. And God will, might say to you, is this where you want to go? Go. God has left us with that beautiful choice to go with him or to stop. And we need to constantly make that choice. No, Lord. I had searched for God for 20 years and I knew that I couldn't go anywhere else to find him because I'd tried everywhere else. I'd looked for his love in many different places and in many different ways. And I knew what Peter was saying, where else can I go? And I knew that if this was going to be it, that was it, but I couldn't go anywhere else. And so I stayed for no other reason because I couldn't go anywhere else. But we all come to these crossroads in our life when we have to make a choice. And I pray and pray that God will come into those areas and make you realise that the choice is still yours, but if you make the choice for him, by his grace he will pull you through it and take you through the other end. Now, God willing, there are people who have dropped out because it's been too hard, but it's not too late. They are still breathing. And they, God can still touch them by his grace and bring them back. Get them back onto their feet. Get them back into the race. Bring them back to his first love. And suddenly they have something to focus on, something they know that they're on the right direction. It takes a while when you, when, when you come back into that to break through some of these areas. But don't give up because he has made a way through. Just as he made a way from the cross to the very finish for you and all of us to make a way through. God will keep us on that race from when we started to when we finish if we allow him. The last point, it's not in vain. How many of you ever looked at your Christian walk, and Paul did, wondered whether it was all in, in, in vain? He said in, uh, uh, in 2 Philippians chapter 16, sorry, Philippians chapter 2, verse 16, I hold fast the words of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or laboured in vain. It's easy to think it's all for nothing sometimes, isn't it? Life, on the whole, is mundane. It's looking after kids, it's going to work, it's doing what we have to do, cutting lawns, taking out the rubbish, and it, become, it becomes quite mundane. And yet that, are, that is a life that we are chosen to walk. But it's a different life because we have Jesus Christ in it. It's not a mundane life because there is a purpose in that life, not only for you, but people that you meet along the way. And so Paul says here, it's not in vain. Now, not only does Paul says it, but if you read the Bible, Jesus also, also tells us it's not for nothing. I have a plan for you, he says. I have a purpose. I have, have a destiny. The word of God, if you read Psalms, just tells you that over and over again. It's not in vain. It might seem like it when things are mundane, but God has a purpose for every one of us in this race. And God lovingly has put each and every one of us into a race. We're all different races. We're not, we are sort of running side by side, but we're not. Each race we run is, is actually different, but we are in a race from the start to the finish. Last example. 1968 Olympics. It was a marathon runner named uh, Stephen John uh, Aquari from Tanzania. Everyone heard his name? Became very, very famous. Not for winning the marathon, but for coming last. And you think, how could... He was the fastest runner in Africa when he was chosen. 
and he came last. And yet he is more famous than the guy that won the race. That marathon was different to all the other marathons because the 1968 Olympics were held at Mexico City. Now, Mexico City is 7,350 metres above sea level. And that's a fairly high altitude, and at a high altitude, people have trouble breathing and they suffer from muscle spasms and cramps and all these things. A lot of the runners didn't make it. 79 started only 57 finished and Stephen Aquari was number 57. Now halfway into that race not only was he suffering from cramps and having trouble breathing he was in a crowd and he got knocked by the other runners he fell over hit his head hit his shoulders cut his knee and dislocated that joint 20 kilometres into the race and he fell over. Most people would give up but he got up and he kept on hobbling the last 22 kilometres to finish the race. Now if you know the marathon it's the last event in the Olympic calendar and the guy that won the race Mamo Waldi finished in 2 hours 20 minutes and 26 second. He came in, number second came in and number third. They got their prizes and that was the end of the Olympics. Now people started to go home and yet Stephen was still running. Now somehow word had got out that there was still one runner still running and thousands came back into the stadium to witness this guy who was last. And about an hour and 15 minutes later, he hobbles in to do the last circuit of this marathon race. With thousands of people who shouldn't have been there, they should have gone home, came back to watch this man come last. Now, when he finished the race, he was asked, why did you keep on going? And his answer was, my country did not send me 5,000 yeah, K to start a race, they sent me 5,000 kilometres to finish the race. And people, I can assure you today that Jesus did not die on that cross just for you to start the race. He died and he suffered and he bled and he suffered terribly that you might finish the race. And we need to have that in our hearts when we're running each day. It is too easy to give up. I've watched my kids give up, I've seen my friends give up, and I still hope and pray that each one of them will one day get off their rear ends and start to find the love of Christ and start to move forward. Paul said at the very end of his career, I have fought the good fight, I have kept the faith. Is that what he said? Anyone know scripture? It's not, not exactly what he said. He said, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. People, we are in a race. We are in a race not to win, but we are in a race to finish. And sometimes life knocks us down like it did Stephen. Sometimes we are hurt, we are bruised, we are battered. Dislocated knee. Can you imagine running 22 kilometres with a dislocated joint? It's bad enough when you just dislocate the joint without running on it. But people, he kept on going, and we need to keep on going in the things of God. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, I've read part of it before. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him, despising the shame, has sat down at the right hand of God the Father. Jesus finished a race so that we could finish the race. Now people, we're all at different places, we're all suffering through different things, and it's not easy. But Jesus makes a way through. He has made a way through because of the cross. That veil was torn, never to be closed again. 
And that way is open for us all the time. People, if you've lost your first love, then get back to your first love. If you've given up hope or you're going backwards, then turn around and just start facing Jesus again. It's as simple as that. It's not a difficult thing to do. You go one way or go the other. The choice will always be yours. But the choice we need to make is for him and because of his love. We'll close there. Heavenly Father, Lord, we all want to finish. And that's not the, the thing which is in our heart. The thing which is in our heart is, Lord, how do we run this race? And Lord, we cannot run it without you. It's only by your grace, Lord, that you pick us up. It's only by the power of your Holy Spirit that you get us moving again. It's only for the fact, Lord, that we know that you have done it all, that you have finished it, that you have paid that price, that we can let things go and move forward into the things of you. But Lord, we all need to overcome things and become overcomers. And that is done by loving you and following you. Lord, you always go before us. You've already run that race for us. You've already won the prize for us. And Lord, you stand there with open, open arms waiting to greet us with that prize you have for each and every one of us. And so, Father, I pray for every situation here no matter how difficult it seems to them at the moment, Lord, I know there is a way through. And Lord, no matter how painful it is, I know, love that your love can come in and comfort and reassure and bring these people through. Father, I give this church to you. Lord, may we finish the race with your glory. May we be able to run the race that you have set before us. And so, Heavenly Father, I pray by your grace that people would know that grace here and now, know that assurance, be able to look to you and to keep on going no matter what the cost in Jesus' name. Bless you all. I think we've got another song.